and time permitting, we will give you an opportunity to speak. All right, so our speaker today is Dr. Kimberly Fisher, who is an Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Medicine and the Division of Health System Science at the UMass Chan Medical School. She received her MD from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and completed internal medicine residency at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, as well as pulmonary and critical care fellowship at Boston University School of Medicine. She also has a master's degree in clinical investigation from UMass Chan Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. And Dr. Fisher's research centers on improving patient provider communication um, and, and includes an NIH funded research focused on increasing COVID-19 vaccine uptake in patients. Uh, with formal training in implementation science through the Training Institute and in Dissemination and Implementation Research and Health program. Uh, Dr. Fisher has experience with a variety of research method methods, and I'm really looking forward to hearing her discussion today on how best to communicate with patients on vaccination. And so with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Fisher. Dr. Fisher, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much, Janet and ATS, for um, providing this opportunity. I'm really happy to be here with everybody today, and I'm particularly excited at the increasing interest in um, promoting vaccine uptake um, at the ATS, and I'm excited to be part of those efforts. Um, as Janet said, I'm going to be talking about what works to increase uptake of um, vaccines through patient-provider communication. Let's see if I can get my slides to work. Um, so. This um, just shows my funding sources and um, of particular relevance to the ATS. I feel like I should mention that I don't have any tobacco industry or other industry sponsored um, funding. And this is an overview of what I'm going to cover today. I'm going to, oh, whoops, sorry. So I'm going to start by introducing the increasing vaccination model, which is a really helpful way to think about um, vaccine uptake. I'm going to focus on reviewing the evidence of the impact that supports the impact of a healthcare provider recommendation on vaccine uptake. I'm going to talk a little bit about what constitutes an effective recommendation. And I'll answer the question, um, I'll give you a preview that no, one size does not fit all. So then I'll um, spend some time talking about how vaccine hesitant individuals prefer to be communicated with. And then I'd like to save a little bit of time at the end to um, talk a little bit about some important levers to increase vaccination beyond um, communication. Um, I'd like to start by reminding everyone of this very important distinction between vaccines and vaccinations, which I believe was first put forth by um, Dr. Walt Orenstein um, when he said, vaccines don't save lives, vaccinations do. Um, there's really been no more stark illustration of this distinction between vaccines and vaccinations than the COVID-19 pandemic. So on the one hand, we have the unprecedented scientific and technological accomplishment of having effective vaccines less than a year into a pandemic with a new infection. And yet, on the other hand, um, in this study that we conducted in April of 2020, we found that nearly half of the US adult population was not sure or did not intend to be vaccinated when a COVID-19 vaccine became available, illustrating a lot of work to get the needed to get vaccines into um, vaccinations. Um, I find the increasing vaccination model to be a really helpful way of thinking about how to move from vaccine to vaccination. Um, this was first proposed by Noel Brewer in um, 2017. It's since been adopted and adapted by the World Health Organization. And the version I'm showing you here is a slightly adapted form. Um, it posits three main categories of activities or levers that influence whether someone will get vaccinated. So the first is what people think and feel. And this really focuses on the balance between 
um, disease risk appraisal. So how much someone thinks they're at risk from a given vaccine preventable disease balanced with their confidence in the safety and effectiveness of vaccines. It also notes the importance of various social processes, including a provider recommendation in promoting uptake of vaccines. And then importantly, it includes this last category that's called practical strategies. Um, in the earlier iteration of it, it was called direct behavior change. And so it's really an acknowledgement that there are all these levers that we have that can increase vaccine uptake. And importantly, they don't necessarily require that you change what people think and feel. So you can sometimes get people to get vaccinated, even if they haven't changed their thinking about the vaccine. Um, so as I said before, most of uh, my talk now is gonna really focus on the role of a provider recommendation within this model. Um, it's been well established that healthcare providers have an important role to play in promoting vaccination. So um, multiple studies have found across all demographic groups that healthcare providers are consistently cited as the most trusted source of information about vaccines. Um, in these two large nationally representative surveys, one looking at influenza vaccine uptake and the other looking at COVID-19 vaccine uptake, you can see that respondents who um, reported having received a provider recommendation shown in the red bars for vaccination were more likely to have been vaccinated against COVID or the flu. Um, not only is it important to recommend vaccination, it turns out that it also really matters what you say. So this is a seminal paper that's now um, 10 years old, although it's in the pediatric literature, so it's possible that others aren't familiar with it. Um, in this paper, Doug Opal, who's a pediatrician at the University of Washington, video recorded conversations between parents of children age 1 to 19 months old who were being seen for health supervision visits. So these are visits at which time vaccination is routinely recommended. He um, described and coded the provider's um, initiation of a vaccine recommendation. So how did they first bring up the prospect of getting their kids vaccinated? Um, and he described two distinct patterns to how providers initiated these recommendations. The first one he um, termed a presumptive recommendation. So this is a recommendation that linguistically presupposes that parents would vaccinate. So they just say, well, we have to do some shots today. And this is the approach used in the majority of the encounters. This is contrasted with what he termed a participatory recommendation. And so that's when the provider starts with really more asking a question. What do you want to do about shots today? And in this study, they found really striking differences in the frequency of parental resistance to vaccination based on the recommendation type that the um, provider led with. So among parents who got a presumptive recommendation, only about a quarter of them were to vaccination as compared to those who got a participatory recommendation where the vast majority of them were resistant. Um, you might astutely be wondering whether um, these differences are just because this is an observational study and providers may be more likely to make a participatory recommendation if they sense vaccine hesitancy among the parents, um, you would be correct. Um, however, importantly, the research team assessed the degree of vaccine hesitancy prior to these visits. They didn't share that information with the providers. Um, so they were able to control for the degree of parental vaccine hesitancy. And they found this exact same pattern, even when they restricted the analysis to just vaccine hesitant parents. 
Um, and then you can see in their adjusted odds ratio, which takes into account parental vaccine hesitance, that a participatory recommendation was associated with a 17.5 increased odds of parental resistance. Um, so I think this is a really striking finding about the importance of how we recommend vaccination to patients. Um, this work has since been expanded to the influenza vaccine as well as the HPV vaccine. And there's just two things I wanna point out here. Um, the first is to say that um, similar to the prior study I just told you about, both of these studies are still observational studies. So the question of causation is still a little bit of an open uh, question. I'll tell you more about that in the next slide. And the other thing I want to point out really just relates to terminology. So from here on out, the literature on this topic gets a little bit inconsistent in terms of the terminology. So I just wanted to provide sort of like a key or a definition for everybody that um, people use these terms interchangeably. So a presumptive style recommendation is the same as what other people refer to as an indicated style or an announcement style recommendation. And those are all contrasted with a participatory or elective or conversation style approach. And that will become important in the next study I tell you about, which uses the announcement versus conversational style terminology. So to address the question of causality, Noel Brewer and his group conducted a cluster randomized trial in which um, pediatric clinics were randomized to receive training in either making an announcement style recommendation or uh, training in making a conversation style recommendation. And you can see that the main difference in these is that with the announcement style, like the presumptive recommendation, you just say they're due for these vaccines, I could give them to you now. And if there's no resistance, they just go ahead and vaccinate and only get into a deeper conversation with the parents who um, raise objections or concerns. Whereas the providers trained in the conversation style approach were trained to um, introduce the topic with a conversation, finding out about the parental concerns, and then after addressing those to then recommend vaccination. And you can see here that at both three months following this training and six months following this training, HPV vaccine uptake increased significantly more among the patients seen at clinics here in the dark red bar uh, where providers received training in the announcement style approach compared to the conversation style approach or the control group. So I think this study really answers the question of whether um, it's a chicken or the egg with a presumptive recommendation or an announcement style recommendation and indicates that um, these really do increase uptake of vaccination, not the other way around. So in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic with, as you all know, an unprecedented degree of politicization and misinformation surrounding COVID-19 vaccines, um, we were curious in my group whether the presumptive recommendation approach would be effective against COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy. So to test this, we conducted a vignette-based experimental online survey using an opt-in panel called Prolific. We oversampled Black and Latino members because our prior work had indicated that they were more likely to be vaccine hesitant and we were hoping to enrich for vaccine hesitancy. Um, and then I just also want to point out that we conducted this study in January 2021. So you might remember that at this time in the um, pandemic, vaccines had become available, but they were still not widely available to the general population. So at this point, we were still um, assessing vaccine intent rather than actual uptake. We classified participants as vaccine hesitant right off the bat. 
if they responded to this question, do you intend to be vaccinated against COVID-19 by saying either no or not sure? And so this shows you that um, among the roughly 1,700 respondents to this survey, about 40% of them were classified as vaccine hesitant. Um, and the folks in this group were randomly assigned to receive one of five different messages from a healthcare provider. So this is where the experimental vignette part of the survey comes in. Um, we asked participants to imagine that they were seeing their doctor for a regular checkup. And at the end of the appointment, the doctor tells them that they have the COVID-19 vaccine available and the patient's eligible to get it. It's very safe and very effective. Everybody was exposed to this message. And then after that, we exposed them to one of these five varied messages that I'll tell you about in the next slide. After exposure to these messages, we reassessed vaccination intent with the question, would you get vaccinated at this visit? So we designed a series of um, four messages that were designed to address the most common concerns that we heard about in our prior work of vaccine hesitant individuals. And we also tried to work in some um, persuasive messaging techniques, like for example, millions of people have already gotten it, kind of um, uses this concept of social proof that can help um, persuade people to do things. All of these four messages were combined with an indicated style recommendation. And then our fifth message was an elective style recommendation in which the doctor just said, you know, after saying the vaccine is available, you're eligible to get it, it's safe and effective, they then just said, what do you think? Um, so this shows that following a brief simulated recommendation from a doctor, uh, many participants became less hesitant. And the thing I want to point out is that, not surprisingly, the impact of a doctor recommendation was much greater amongst the group that was less hesitant to begin with. So those who said they were not sure whether they would per, uh, whether they would get vaccinated compared to those who were more hesitant, those who said, no, I don't intend to be vaccinated the impact of a doctor recommendation was less. Um, in looking in more detail at all the messages, and I'm going to start with um, the group who were initially not sure, we found that there was no significant difference between any of those four different messages that we so carefully designed. It basically didn't matter. Um, they all had the same impact on intent to get vaccinated. The only one that was different was the um, elective style, what do you think message was um, significantly less likely to reduce vaccine hesitancy than the indicated style messages. We found a slightly different pattern amongst the group who was more hesitant. So again, these are the ones who answered our first question about vaccine hesitancy saying that no, they don't intend to be vaccinated. And in this group, we found that um, what I refer to as a pro-social message. So this is the message, um, it's the best way to protect the people you're close to, was the one that was most effective amongst the more hesitant um, respondents. So I think that these findings um, all together indicate a need for communication that's tailored according to the degree of hesitancy, since we saw such different patterns between those who were not sure versus those who originally said no. And I think it suggests that there may be a role for pro-social messaging among more hesitant individuals. Um, there were two other groups about the same time who did very similar studies, but with a different set of messages, but both of them also included a um, pro-social message, and they also both found that that seemed to be the most effective message um, at increasing vaccine uptake. 
So just to summarize kind of what I've said so far about what we know about healthcare provider recommendations, um, it's very clear that a healthcare provider recommendation is associated with increased uptake of vaccines. And this has been shown across now influenza, HPV, as well as COVID-19 vaccines. A um, presumptive or indicated style recommendation is more effective at increasing vaccine uptake than a participatory recommendation. And a message that emphasizes protecting others or a pro-social message may be particularly effective among more vaccine hesitant individuals. So shifting gears a little bit, I showed you these data before that illustrate the impact of a provider recommendation on vaccine uptake. So you can see that the uh, respondents who got a provider recommendation were more likely to get vaccinated against the um, flu compared to those who didn't get a provider recommendation. But what I'd like to focus on now is what I call the half empty part of the glass. So what about the 50% of the population who got a provider recommendation and still didn't get vaccinated against influenza. Um, this percentage is smaller for COVID-19, although I suspect that um, as things go on and we start to factor in the COVID-19 booster, it'll actually become an even bigger problem for COVID-19. I know sometimes presenters um, pose a question like this to tee it up that they're about to tell you the answer to this question. So I should warn you that I'm actually really asking this question because I think there's no definitive answer about how to communicate with the patients who are hesitant despite a presumptive recommendation for vaccination. Um, so what I am going to do is share some qualitative data that we collected through focus groups with COVID-19 vaccine hesitant patients and a parallel set of focus groups with PCPs. And I think that this provides some insights into what might be an effective approach with this group. Um, so as part of an ongoing project to promote COVID-19 vaccination by leveraging the role of PCPs, we conducted um, focus groups with patients who were unvaccinated against COVID-19 between August and October of 2021. Um, and we heard a number of themes from them that I think kind of fit into two broad categories. The first is, um, I think, some themes that can give us all a greater understanding of kind of what some of these unvaccinated patients are bringing with them to the encounter in terms of their prior experiences and beliefs. Um, so the first theme that we heard from all of these participants is that they're um, extremely distrustful of COVID-19 vaccine related information. So one participant said, I think they're using us as rats in a laboratory. Somebody else said, I'm African-American. We find it hard to trust anything. Um, and somebody else, after having um, just watched a video of real doctors talking about the COVID-19 vaccine, they concluded that um, they were not real doctors. They were actors. They were acting and just saying what they were told to say. Um, many of them are struggling to navigate conflicting information, and this is, of course, a product of all the misinformation um, that we have nowadays. So here's a participant saying, um, this is just what I heard. I'm not a doctor. I don't know. These are just things I've heard. But how do I listen to this, but not listen to that? What do you decipher? Some of them described feeling stigmatized for not being vaccinated. So this participant said there's a lot of shaming. It's all over social media. People are very hateful towards people that aren't vaccinated. And somebody else had experienced that through her friends and family. And she said, it's sort of like an I'm better than thou attitude from the folks that have now gotten their vaccination. The other broad category of themes that we heard from these um, participants was um, some insights into how they want healthcare providers to communicate with them. 
<clears throat> so they want information that is detailed and that they perceive to be unbiased. Um, so this is one participant saying, um, all you hear is it's good, it's going to keep you safe, but what about the short and long-term effects? And many of them felt that the um, reports of minimal side effects, they really took to be um, evidence of bias or lack of transparency. And so they said, don't overpromise the lack of side effects. Many of them indicated that they'd be more receptive to information if they felt like it wasn't being um, force fed or pushed on them. So this person is saying um, that they would listen if we said it wasn't the holy grail, but if you're being force fed something, a lot of people are gonna resist. And this is an important concept in vaccine hesitancy that among some vaccine hesitant patients, the more we push, the more they push back. Um, this issue of reactance or resistance. Um, and here's somebody else saying, if someone's applying a lot of pressure, you kind of stop and say, why do they want to force me to do this? And they're distrustful. Um, but if somebody were to pause and say, eh, do it if you want, then they might say, yes, give it to me. Um, and then lastly, they really want to feel listened to and understood. So this person said, you know, they want us to really address those concerns with real compassion and empathy. And somebody else said, don't dismiss people. Those questions are valid. Um, so now I want to turn to what we heard from PCPs. And the goal of this slide is just to illustrate that PCPs described a number of different strategies that they use in communicating with their unvaccinated patients. And what's most important here is that the actual strategy, or what's more important than the actual strategies is just to show that their strategies largely fit into the increasing vaccination model buckets of they try to influence what patients think and feel, and they try to leverage their social and relational processes to promote vaccination. We also heard from PCPs about a number of challenges that they have encountered in communicating with unvaccinated patients. Um, and in case this um, description of challenges seems to undermine some of my earlier um, comments on the importance of a healthcare provider recommendation, I just wanna point out that these challenges I'm about to describe really relate to the subset of um, patients who are most vaccine hesitant. So these don't broadly apply to all patients. Um, but what PCPs described is that their most hesitant patients aren't open to information. So they would present information to their patients. And then this one says, most of the time, it still doesn't change their mind. And here's another PCP who described presenting the evidence that we have, and then the patient still says, actually, never mind, that evidence doesn't mean anything to me. This led many PCPs to question whether they really are the most trusted messengers among the more vaccine hesitant patients. So one PCP described, um, I've had so many people tell me you don't know what you're talking about. And somebody else said, it's particularly frustrating because over 30 years, I've been able to tap into that trust and confidence, and I find that it works for this less than it works for anything else. As a result of these challenges, um, many PCPs adopted a strategy of truncating their communication with their most um, vaccine hesitant patients. So if they perceived that somebody was potentially convincible, they would still try to talk to them as much as they could every time they see them. But for those who they perceived as um, not open to information, they really would make a recommendation and then um, not continue the conversation. And they did this because they didn't want to waste their time. So this one says, I'm not going to waste my time lecturing people who have no interest. It's a waste of my time and it's a waste of theirs. And they also did it because they didn't want to disrupt their relationship with the patient. So this person says, you know, if you continue to push, you'll lose the person and you want them to come back so you can still help them in some other way. 
And then the universal theme <clears throat> amongst all of the PCPs is that they're all really frustrated with these conversations and they really don't know what to say to these patients. So they describe um, it's frustrating and quite challenging because it adds on time and that's frustrating and stressful. And this one says, it's frustrating because you speak to the same people and you wonder what else, I don't know what else I could say for some of my patients. Um, so in thinking about kind of how to bridge this gap between what we hear from the patients and what we hear from the providers, I wanted to just introduce a communication approach um, that hasn't been well established, particularly for adult vaccination, but is very promising. So for those of you who are not familiar with motivational interviewing, this is a communication approach that's based in principles of patient-centeredness, empathic communication, and respect for autonomy. It's been used most widely in um, substance use disorder counseling, although it has also started to be looked at for promoting vaccination. And one um, known feature of this approach is that it can reduce resistance, which as I described earlier, is a known feature of vaccine hesitancy. So there have been two studies so far that have started to explore whether there's a role for motivational interviewing to promote uptake of vaccination. Um, one was a postpartum intervention and the other one was to promote uptake of the HPV vaccine. Both of these interventions showed a significant increase in vaccine uptake, but they both had limitations. So the first one is a quasi-experimental design. It was not randomized. And the intervention was an educational session administered by a trained research assistant on a maternity ward. So it leaves questions about how you would um, bring this to the primary care setting and how you might scale it. Um, the second study was a um, multi-component intervention. And that's really the main weakness of that one is that the intervention included a number of components, including communication training on motivational interviewing. So it's unknown what the active ingredient in that intervention is, but I will say that the um, intervention providers cited the communication training as one of the most used and in their mind, most useful component. Um, so I think these studies both suggest a potential role for motivational interviewing to promote vaccine uptake, but there are a number of unanswered questions, including whether this approach would be effective for adult vaccination. All of these prior studies have been in pediatrics. Um, this is an approach, unlike a presumptive recommendation, which everybody could just go and make starting tomorrow, uh, motivational interviewing is really an approach that requires some formal training. And then that brings in some issues about getting adult healthcare providers to do it. I think that promoting vaccination is a much more um, entrenched part of pediatric medicine than in adult medicine. So there may be more appetite for training in this in the um, pediatric world. Um, and in case people are wondering, how do you square presumptive recommendations with motivational interviewing? Because these really are sort of almost opposite approaches. One is kind of just assumes you're going to do it, let's go ahead and do it. And the other one is really a much um, sort of gentler, let me find out more about what the patient's thinking approach. Um, I would agree that they really are opposites. And I think that um, what's likely needed is to make a presumptive recommendation to all patients. And then when they've um, expressed hesitancy or you encounter resistance, at that point, there's a need to pivot to a different strategy. What that strategy is, I think is still unclear, but I think motivational interviewing and perhaps pro-social messages are both promising potential strategies. So, um, up until now, I've mostly focused on provider-patient communication, 
which um, really fits in the first two boxes of the increasing vaccination model. But now I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about um, practical strategies and how providers' role in promoting vaccination also extends to the practical strategies box. Um, so this shows the results of a survey that we conducted in 2021 in which we asked participants where they would prefer to be vaccinated. And what I'm showing you here are the percentage who indicated they would prefer to be vaccinated at a doctor's office. And you can see that among the participants who were unsure whether they would get vaccinated, a majority preferred to be vaccinated against COVID-19 at a doctor's office. We also found that for um, all levels of vaccine intent, so whether their intent was yes, not sure, or no, um, Black participants were significantly more likely to prefer to be vaccinated at a doctor's office than white or Latino participants. So this led us to conclude that vaccine availability on site at doctor's offices may be important at increasing vaccine uptake among vaccine hesitant individuals and members of racial minorities. Um, from our PCP focus group um, data, we found that the PCPs really sort of corroborated this finding. So um, we had some PCPs who participated who work in clinics where they had on-site COVID-19 vaccination and others where they didn't. And the ones who had the COVID-19 vaccine available at their clinics described vaccine availability in clinic as a game changer. So this PCP said, um, since we've been able to offer the vaccine in our clinic, I've gotten a lot more people to agree to it. And this is a quote from a PCP working in a clinic where the COVID-19 vaccine is not available on site. And they said that they felt like if it were available, they could get some of their most difficult patients because they found that available in the moment. But as soon as it takes a step where you have to describe, you know, setting up an appointment at CVS, the PCP recognized they start to lose them and they can already see the deer in the headlight look and they've missed an opportunity to get them vaccinated. Um, the importance of on-site clinic vaccine availability has also been confirmed on the national flu survey that I previously showed you. So I previously showed you these first two bars that indicate that a provider recommendation is associated with a um, higher influenza vaccine uptake. But what I didn't show you that's even better than that is a um, provider recommendation plus an offer to vaccinate right there on site. So you can see that a significantly higher percentage of patients who received a recommendation plus an offer got vaccinated against the flu compared to those who only received a recommendation. And um, while we're on the topic of practical strategies to increase vaccination, I also wanna share some very preliminary results of a study that we've been working on in which we interviewed um, what we describe as recently vaccinated um, people. So these are people who have gotten their first dose of a COVID-19 vaccine since April, 2022. We interviewed them to find out what the main reason um, for them getting vaccinated this far into vaccine availability was. And we categorized these main reasons according to the increasing vaccination model. Um, these um, circles are drawn to scale based on the frequency of each main reason. So you can see that some people reported reasons for getting vaccinated that are consistent with the what people think and feel category. So maybe they know someone who was really sick with COVID and that increased their disease risk appraisal and they decided to get vaccinated. Or maybe they saw lots of people getting vaccinated and they seemed to be okay. And so they became more convinced that the vaccine was safe. A smaller 
percentage of people reported um, reasons consistent with social processes as influencing their decision to get vaccinated at this stage in the um, COVID pandemic. But by far, the most common um, main reason for getting vaccinated among people who've been vaccinated more recently was that the vaccine was required for something that they wanted to do. And these were almost exclusively um, for a new job or to travel. So things like I wanted to go on a cruise um, and so I got vaccinated. Um, so I think this really illustrates the importance of practical strategies, um, particularly in getting some of the more hesitant people vaccinated. There's been a lot in the literature about a potential downside of um, vaccine requirements. And I will say that of the 51 participants, there was only one who was required to be vaccinated and was like really angry about it. Everybody else seemed pretty nonchalant about the fact that they'd been required to be vaccinated. Um, I don't want to incorrectly suggest that there isn't a role for what people think and feel or social processes in promoting vaccination. So in addition to asking about the main reason people had for getting vaccinated, we also explored secondary reasons. And so you can see here that although they were infrequently cited as the main reason, social processes, including a healthcare provider recommendation and what people think and feel, played an important um, secondary or supporting role. And so I think that in many cases, these kind of laid the groundwork for people to accept the practical requirement to be vaccinated, although they were not the main reason. Um, so how do we put all of this together? Um, I hope I've shown that a provider recommendation is extremely influential and that exactly what one says when making a recommendation is really important. I think that the provider recommendation, um, or I think this model is a little more complicated than all these arrows show, because I think a provider recommendation likely um, influences what people think and feel. And I think that the power of a healthcare provider recommendation can really be magnified if it's combined with practical strategies, particularly the availability of on-site vaccination. Um, so looking forward to what can we expect in the future, and I'll just give two disclaimers, which is I don't have a crystal ball. And at one point early on, I thought the internet was a bad idea, so I may not be the best person to make predictions. Um, but I think we should expect that we will have more and hopefully better vaccines continuing to be developed. At the same time, I think that particularly with um, generative AI, we can expect misinformation and disinformation, perhaps on an even larger scale than we've seen so far. And I think this is going to make the role of a healthcare provider in promoting vaccine uptake simultaneously harder, but also ever more important. And then on the um, practical issue side, I think that with the end, the coming end of the public health emergency, um, particularly COVID-19 vaccines will likely not be as easily accessible and free, particularly for vulnerable populations who don't have insurance. Um, and there are likely to be fewer vaccine requirements for adults. I think a lot of places put vaccine requirements in place because of the pandemic, but when that's perceived to be over, I'm not sure that those will continue. So although this may sound a little bit negative, what I really want to highlight is just the need for ongoing work in this area to really fully bring the role of healthcare providers and systems to bear on promoting vaccination. And that is it. So thank you all for your attention. I want to acknowledge all the members of my UMass research team who all contributed to this work. Um, and I think we're at the question and answer part. Yeah, Kimberly, thank you very much. And 
We have two questions in the chat and I start with Rosemary. She asks, well, uh, she is a little bit worried that the initial presumptive approach could further the hesitancy of the very vaccine hesitant. So do you have any recommendation and how to work out when to use presumptive where those conversational approach? It sounds like asking what someone thinks as a starting point could actually backfire. Yeah, and I, I think, um, Rosemary, you're sort of hitting on exactly kind of this paradox, um, which is that these two almost opposite approaches are needed. Um, I think that the evidence from the pediatric literature, particularly the um, cluster randomized controlled trial of the announcement versus the conversation style approach, really, um, I think, suggests starting with a presumptive approach. I will say that in the um, in the vignette-based experimental survey that I described um, where we exposed people to different messages, we didn't find that the presumptive approach increased hesitancy or backfired at all. So I think a simple recommendation you're due for this vaccine, this vaccine is indicated, I recommend you get it, is unlikely to further the hesitancy of the very vaccine hesitant. But if you make that recommendation and then encounter resistance, I think then that's when you need to pivot a different approach. Um, I actually think that one of the most challenging things about the presumptive approach is that um, it's harder to do than you might think, because if I personally use some of these verbal, I'll call it a verbal tick, like saying, what do you think is kind of a way of trying to show to the patient that you're engaging them and you're interested in what they think. But what we don't realize is that it has um, this unintended consequence or that patients interpret what we're saying um, is a way of kind of building the relationship, they interpret that as, yeah, I don't really need this vaccine or it's optional, it's not strongly recommended. So I think expunging that, what do you think from the initial recommendation is hard, but important. Um, and I don't think that it increases hesitancy it just won't be effective for somebody who's really vaccine hesitant. Um, but I also think we don't always know, we think we know who those people are. We're often right, but not always. So the next question is from Harold and he is a little bit shocked about the low acceptance rate of the most recent COVID vaccination. What is it? Is it lack of recommendation? social reasons, side effects. I would add, what is the role of social media and should we do something to use social media more to increase uh, vaccine adherence? Yeah, so I think there's definitely a role for social media, although um, I'm probably the wrong person to speak about that as a um, somebody who's not very active on social media. Um, there's definitely um, data showing that among people who are open to getting a COVID-19 updated booster, at least 50% of them have not received a recommendation from a provider. So I think that, you know, going back to what we know works, making a presumptive recommendation to everybody at every visit is one um, tool that has clearly not been fully brought to bear to increase the uptake of COVID-19 boosters. Um, we've also done some uh, a survey that we're kind of still analyzing the data, but it seems like there's sort of a couple different um, patterns that people fall into. So there are um, some people who, although they got the initial vaccine series, 
they take the fact that boosters are needed as evidence that it doesn't work. And so they say things like, um, well, if we have to keep getting it every year, what's the point? People are still getting COVID, so why bother getting the booster? So I think that's part of it. Some people are just not aware of the recommendation for an updated um, booster vaccine. So I guess that would go with the lack of awareness. Um, and I think there's a lot of inertia. There are a whole bunch of people who just said, I haven't had time, I haven't gotten around to it yet. And I think for those people, that's where the practical strategies and making it as easy as possible are really important. Do you think the knowledge of a normal person uh, about vaccination is not good enough? And do we need to include uh, such information into uh, the school curriculum or earlier in life? Because what I heard here in Europe is that people are uh, so uninformed mm. about what vaccination is, what it can do. They do not know a lot about the disease but also uh, only a few things about preventive measures. Um, I think that increasing knowledge is always helpful. We definitely found um, that knowledge is associated with vaccine uptake. Um, but I also think that sometimes we work under kind of an information deficit model. So if only we told them the information they need to know, then of course they would want to be vaccinated. Um, I suspect many um, clinicians here who've had these conversations with their patients know that oftentimes, even after giving them all the information, that doesn't actually um, overcome their hesitancy. But I am interested in the idea of starting this education earlier. And I, um, one strategy that I didn't talk about at all, um, that's a very promising approach for um, addressing the issue of misinformation, which certainly is a huge contributor to the vaccine hesitancy problem, is this idea called pre-bunking, which is that once the misinformation has taken hold, it's incredibly hard to dislodge it and change somebody's mind, even with information. But if you, and I think what you're suggesting, Tobias, either give people information about vaccination early on before they get exposed to misinformation, that could be helpful. And a more universal approach is um, teaching people how to recognize misinformation is effective at um, making them more resilient to misinformation. So that's kind of like a more generic approach where you could, if started early, and I think there are some European countries, I feel like maybe Finland or Denmark were recently in the news for doing a good job with this. They've incorporated this into their elementary school curriculum where they're teaching kids at a young age how to recognize misinformation. And I think that really does promote resilience against them. Well, well, the Scandinavian countries advertise it in the media. Uh, so do France. Uh, this is not the case in Germany. Do, do you think that such kind of public sponsored advertising is something which uh, could be of benefit in the US or is it something which will raise concerns? I don't know. I think that um, unfortunately our media ecosystem is so fragmented and is such an um, echo chamber. And I also think that once, you know, again, I think once this, I, the misinformation has been planted, um, we run into all these issues with like confirmation bias and getting somebody to change their mind, no matter what you tell them, they just continue to see evidence that supports what their original belief is. So I think that, um, I don't wanna say there's no role for information or awareness, but I think that it's um, less effective and harder to change people's minds if they've been misinformed already. And I think that the practical strategy 
likely to have a lot more um, bang for their buck. So the time is gone. So I will finish with uh, a comment from Peter here in the chat. So he said, thank you, Kimberly, for a very clear, logical and helpful presentation. Many audiences could benefit from this presentation. And I think that's what I think. And I'm sure Janet is, uh, agrees with me. So uh, thank you very much for doing this and for underlining uh, the necessity uh, to make up your mind how uh, to face the patient and which strategy necessary uh, to be used uh, for um, yeah, convincing uh, patients what is the best strategy for the future. So thanks, Rosie also said, a great, great talk. Uh, it's my pleasure to thank you very much. I have to thank Janet as ever, and uh, also Anna who organized it from the ATS side. And I hope we will meet sometimes and can share our, uh, our experience. Thank you, Kimberly, and best wishes for your child and all, oh, thank all you. the best. Uh, for the rest of the day. Um, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share this. So thank you to everybody who helped make it happen. Yeah, and thank you, yeah, to you. So. so maybe at the end, Janet and I, we would announce that we will go on with the series about vaccination here uh, on the ATS website. I think one of the next sessions will be a talk given by Charles Feldman, uh, from South Africa, who will address the need for global strategies uh, for vaccination. I think a very important topic, because what we learned in COVID-19 is it's good when there's good vaccination rate in some countries in the world, but it's a global problem and it needs global solution. And these global health in uh, make it, it possible for low-income countries to be part of the program is important. So thanks to you all. Have a good day. For me, it's late evening, so I'm going out for dinner now, and uh, see you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.